Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. Extending a warm welcome to all who are worshiping with us in person, especially all visitors who are with us today and welcoming all who are worshiping with us via technology. Uh, we build community by sharing announcements and joys and concerns. And before Beverly can even take one, I see there's someone upstairs. Hi, Susan. Susan Mercy. I heard there's a holiday today. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> So, uh, today's prelude and postlude are music that come from the British Isles. Um, William Laybourne was a violinist, a violin teacher, a violin improvi improviser, and conductor in the 1800s. And he was the editor of a magazine that went out monthly full of fiddle tunes. And all of these fiddle tunes were, co were compiled into three very large volumes of music called the Kohler's Re Repository of Dance Music. <laughs> there are hundreds of lovely tunes to celebrate today, so Roger won't need to preach a sermon because I'll just be playing. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> I, I thought maybe I would select tunes that had something to do with a woman, since it's Women's History Month, but there were also hundreds of tunes that had female names, so that was going to be a chore. And then I found a few tunes that I thought fit with my life. So the prelude is made up of tunes called The Bottle Bank, The Forest Where the Deer Resort, Dutch Polka, and then there are two gypsy hornpipes. The postlude is made up of the tunes The Fiddler's Fancy, The Bell Polka, the Pear Tree, Glenn's Hornpipe, and Fiddler's Cramp. Mom, if you're watching online, you will be able to connect the dots to know how I chose these tunes. Anyone else gets bonus points if you can figure out their connection to my life. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Susan. Okay, other things to share. Way over here, Beverly, on this side, way in the back.
morning, Gerald Bruce on behalf of trustees. Uh, I'd like you to mark your calendar for our spring work day, which we're gonna have April 13th. So in a few weeks, that's a Saturday and April 20th, if we have rain that uh, on the 13th. So um, we'll get out there and do all the spring type things. So thank you. Debbie Hayes on behalf of the Board of Deacons. This Wednesday is our final, um, our fifth and final Lenten Soup Supper here in the, uh, at, in the Fellowship Hall at 6 p.m. We will be gathering for soup and then we will have a conversation at the table afterwards and then come down here to the sanctuary for a quiet reflection time. So this is our last one. And I have to tell you, the first four have been absolutely delightful with over 45 people coming on a regular basis. That's just a lot of people coming on Wednesday evening for a, a lovely couple hours together during this Lenten season. So please feel free to join us. There's lots of soup. Just one more thing I forgot to mention. It's gonna be nine to noon on, on that day for the work day. So that's usually the time we have it. So. I'm Kathy Jacobs, and I have a dear friend, Sherry Max, who has just put her husband in palliative care, and they are longtime Mid Midland people. Pat uh, worked for Lake, was it painting? Go ahead, Lake painting? Anyway, but they discovered cancer in many areas, and now he's in Portage, Michigan, on palliative care, so keep the family in your prayers. Thank you. We're not going to pay attention that it is snowing outside, okay? Uh, good morning, Janet, on behalf of BCC and the Deacons on the Lenten Update. So a couple things first. I'm going to start with a big thank you. This has been a huge project, so much planning, so much, uh, I'll say, pivoting and getting the word out and organizing. It's amazing. So I want to make sure I don't forget uh, the leaders of this project, Sherry Lovell, Nancy Heave, Karen Harner, Shirley Rose, and a lot of people sitting here that have been to the sessions and participated in so many ways. So thank you. Our work is not done. I'll just start with that. Um, we've got a good run at it. For those of you who get the Midland News, yay, we were in the paper this week. And um, really, really great article. I understand Laura Alt had a good hand in writing that because it was beautifully written. Uh, also, we have, of course, uh, the donations. We're still taking donations. I'd say we're like 75% of our original goal. So if you can help us get over the top in the next couple weeks, that would be terrific. And uh, although we had originally published a number of sewing sessions, we've decided we've had so much fun, we're going to add a few more. So. We have sessions uh, this week. We're going to do drop-in Tuesdays and Wednesday. We're going to have drop-ins from 10 to 1. If you have a sewing machine you could bring, that would be terrific. Uh, if you're a non-sewer, you're welcome, welcome, because there's so many things we can do. And the last thing is, as we've done for the last, I think, five Sundays, um, after church in the fellowship hall, this time we have the exciting tasks of trimming, clipping, turning pads, and bundling washcloths. I know you're looking for something to do, so that'll, that'll set your Sunday off well. So thanks for everything uh, you do, and I think I hit everything. Thank you. Uh, Chris Brennan, top of the morning to you. A little update on Bella, our granddaughter who is in Houston, um, still in the hospital. You know, she did attempt to take her life, which, you know, just hurts our soul. But we've felt all your prayers, all your thoughts uh, that turn into prayers. Um, she is off the vent and um, getting rehab and and some psychiatric help as well. So we can only look for improvements from here on out. So um, we're gracious for your prayers on that. And on another note, um, in 
for the um, Fine Arts Board, we're going to do a fairy, a fairy house workshop. And uh, tentatively, perhaps, you know, uh, I think it's April 2nd, and we're looking to do the workshop from 10 until 2, and then the next day, an evening workshop on a Wednesday from 6 to 8. Uh, there's a sample table in the fellowship hall. There's the display of fairy houses that we've made in this display. And we're going to um, put them on all of the tables for the fairy tale festival. So if you want to be, you know, involved in that, uh, I'm going to put a sign-up sheet over by the table in the fellowship hall. So thanks. Along with fairy houses, there is a pond in that wood where the deer, what were they doing, Susan? Resorting. <laughs> there, yeah. So in that pond, there's a frog. And the frog is an enchanted frog. So the fairies have been working on helping this enchanted frog, but they need a little help because fairies can't do it all by themselves. So first of all, you can help by turning in whatever you need to turn in for the auction by when? Thank you, Carol. You get an Irish fairy blessing. The 24th. OK. And secondly, there's some slimy, fizzy, Green punch, it's magical, but the magic comes from the love that a certain princess managed to summon and the fear that she managed to banish, because after all, it would be kind of scary to kiss a frog. But she managed it, and the fairies created the punch. So the challenge is, please help the fairies by at least taking a sip or two. Thank you very much. Okay, behind you, Beverly. Uh, uh, Rick Nyaj, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I want to say thank you to the church uh, for this project that they put together and trying to help other people, and especially in South Sudan. So I didn't expect this, uh, that it can be this big. But for me, seeing it happening, I'm so happy. I'm so glad that it has happened, and I witnessed this. So I just want to say thank you and to the group that are doing this and to everybody that contribute as we continue doing this. Uh, it is great for us and for everybody. So hearing that and seeing everybody contribute, that's my joy. And I want to thank you to the church and to everybody. Thank you. Other things to share this morning? Okay, I would point out that our acolyte today is Liam Hahn. His name didn't get in the bulletin. And we would be remiss, I think, if we didn't mention something that's in the bulletin and something that's on the communion table today. Um, Mary Eichhorn is here with her entire family preparing to celebrate her 90th birthday this week. So happy birthday. <laughs> the service over to Susan, I believe.
Continuing with the St. Patrick's Day celebration theme, our call to worship this morning is attributed to St. Patrick's. This is a responsive reading. Our God is the God of all. The God of the sun and of the moon and all of the stars. Our God has dwelling around heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. Our hymn this morning is hymn number four, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. Let's join our voices in the unison prayer. May God give you for every storm a rainbow, for every tear a smile, for every care a promise, and a blessing in each trial. For every problem life sends, a faithful friend to share. 
for every sigh of sweet song and an answer for each prayer. Amen. As adults are seated, I invite children and youth to join me in the front. Good morning. So lovely to see you here. You know, every year our church has a special event to raise money for all the ministries or the work of the church. And each year we choose a different theme. And you might have noticed even from today's announcement that our theme is Fairy Tale Festival. And fairies have been showing up kind of during our announcement times every week. Fairies are found in all different kinds of cultures in different nations around the world. And because today is St. Patrick's Day, and St. Patrick was, uh, the pat is the patron saint of Ireland, I thought that I would share with you a legend or a fairy tale that comes from Ireland. According to legend, leprechauns are small fairy-like creatures who are rather cranky. Have you ever met anyone cranky before? Do you know what that means? Kind of grumpy? Okay, they were, they're kind of grumpy. They have magical powers and they like to trick humans. According to some stories, leprechauns are the ones who make shoes for all the other fairies. And the fairies buy those shoes using golden coins. And leprechauns then like to keep their golden coins hidden, but if a human being catches a leprechaun, they can force the leprechaun to show them where the coins are hidden. But of course, leprechauns always vanish before revealing where their hiding place is. So here is an example of what one of those golden coins might look like. Good catch. Way in the back. Good. Oh, it went right behind you. Oops. A golden coin. So, as you probably know, St. Patrick really didn't have anything to do with leprechauns, right? St. Patrick is known as having helped spread Christianity, helping teach people about the love of God as revealed in Jesus to people in Ireland and help start churches and help to... Uh, build schools. And one of the things that St. Patrick is known for is a special lesson that St. Patrick taught about God. And it happened to be involving one of these. Do you know what that's called? Yeah. It can be a three-leaf clover, or in Ireland, we think of it as a shamrock, right? And so one of the things that that St. Patrick taught is like the three different aspects of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, are represented in the three leaves of the clover or the shamrock, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. And if you look on the back of your coin, you'll see the image of a shamrock. So I invite you to take the coin with you today to remember to have fun, because it's a fun day, but also to remember that God's love is always with you wherever you go. Any thoughts or questions before we go? Let's pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for the fun of sharing fairy tales and the ability to use our imaginations. We also give thanks for the people we know who help us to know you better. May your blessings be upon us this St. Patrick's Day and in all the days ahead. Thanks for your attention, and I think your Sunday school teachers are ready to go to class with you.
Our first reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We now turn to the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 33. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Jesus went on to say, Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it, and they said, It was thunders. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. So ends that Lenten reading. Since the sermon that I shared last week was so well received and included me talking about snakes, I thought maybe today I would start by sharing the legend of St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. It is, after all, his special day. Well, before you brace yourself thinking you're going to hear more about snakes, let me, be ass- let me assure you I'm not going to begin the sermon with that legend. I am, however, going to share a different legend. It is titled, God in Hiding. It goes like this. At the beginning of time, God gathered the angels together and said to them, I want to hide myself in creation. I need to find a place that's not too easily discovered, for it is their search for me that my creatures will grow in wisdom and understanding. The first angel replied, why don't you hide yourself deep in the earth? God pondered that suggestion for a while and then said, no, it won't be long before they learn how to mine the earth and discover all the treasure that it contains. They will discover too quickly and they will not have had enough time to do their growing. A second angel made the following suggestion. Why don't you hide yourself in the moon? God thought about that idea for a while and then replied, No, it will take a little longer, but before too long, they'll learn how to fly through space 
They will arrive on the moon and explore its secrets, and they will discover me too soon, before they have had enough time to do their growing. The angels were at a loss to think of a hiding place. After a long silence, one of the angels said, Why don't you hide yourself within their own hearts? They will never think to look for you there. That's it, God said, delighted to have found the perfect hiding place. And so it is that God hides secretly deep within the heart of every one of God's creatures until the creature has grown enough in spirit and understanding to risk the great journey into the secret core of its own being. And there, the creature discovers its creator and is rejoined to God for all eternity. Like the legend that I just shared with you this morning, the scripture reading from Jeremiah that Beverly read for us talks about God and heart. For many years, the people uh, have been turning themselves away from God. And Jeremiah comes to them and encourages them to turn their lives back to God. They haven't been doing a very good job of loving God or loving their neighbor. In time, the people's worst nightmare comes true when they were taken by the Babylonian Empire into exile. Feeling estranged from God and longing to return to their homeland, it is then that Jeremiah offers a word of hope. Speaking on behalf of God, Jeremiah says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. In reflecting on this promise, biblical scholar Richard Floyd says, despite the people's infidelity, despite corrupt kings and priests, despite injustice and exploitation, despite idolatry, despite all the ways the people have broken faith with God, God will not break faith with them. Instead of yet another word of judgment, the people receive a lavish promise, unexpected good news. God will bring newness out of destruction. God will bring hope where there is no hope. God will bring life out of death. God will make a way where there was no way. No longer will the law be engraved in stone and displayed in the rotundas for all to see and follow. The days are surely coming when the law will be engraved in the people's hearts and displayed in their lives. I have shared with you this morning two stories about hearts. The first story speaks of God being hidden deep within the heart of every one of God's creatures. And as individuals grow in spirit and understanding, they come to recognize that they have always been and will continue to be connected to God. Our second story speaks of God making a covenant on the heart of the people living in exile. God loves the people so much that there is nothing that can separate them from that love. It is a love imprinted on their hearts. Although this promise is made to a specific group of people, I believe it is a promise made to every one of us. I hear it being spoken by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To be pure in heart isn't about being perfect. It is knowing that you are aligned with God, 
loved by God, and strive to serve God. So this morning, I invite you to join with me in reflecting on what it means to have God's covenant of love written on our hearts. For me, it means having a sense of peaceful confidence, knowing that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. This gives me the ability to forgive the mistakes that I have made in the past and the courage to live confidently in the present moment. Trusting that God's love is written on our hearts leads to greater empathy for others, knowing that God's love is imprinted on their hearts as well, including people who have different political and theological beliefs. In some cases, it involves following God's example and offering other people forgiveness. Knowing that God's love is written on the hearts of all people, we work to create greater justice and equality for those who have been marginalized because of gender, race, sexual orientation, ability, or any other ism. It also empowers us to engage in acts of compassion, sometimes sharing those with people in our families and our friends and the people in our church, other times sharing them with people in the greater world. And as people have already shared this morning, one of the most beautiful examples in recent church history is the No Barriers Period project that's been taking place in this church throughout the season of Lent. Dozens and dozens of people have been engaged in hands-on activities. Others have contributed financially. And through that project, we are sharing the love of God with people in a land far, far away. Having God's love written on our hearts lead us, leads us to offer our gratitude for the many gifts we receive, both big and small. It inspires us to find joy in the simple things in life. It gives us confidence to trust our intuition when we're making important decisions. Having God's love written on our hearts means knowing that our relationship with God is ever evolving and that there is always something new to discover regarding our faith. And that, my friends, is a beautiful thing. For those of you who regret having missed last week's sermon that talked about snakes, the good news is you can go to our church's YouTube channel and watch the video. For those of you who are disappointed that I didn't talk more today about St. Patrick banishing snakes from Ireland, know that the History Channel website <laughs> says that he couldn't have driven the snakes from Ireland because research suggests that snakes never occupied the Emerald Island in the first place. There are no snakes or signs of snakes in the country's fossil record. And water has always surrounded Ireland since the glacial period. And before that time, the region was covered in ice, which is not really a good place for reptiles to live. <laughs> for some people, a land free of snakes is truly a sign of God's love. <laughs> May you continue to have a happy St. Patrick's Day. Amen.
I invite you to be seated as we enter into a spirit of prayer. Holy, holy God, on this St. Patrick's Day, we follow the tradition of Celtic Christians, and we give thanks for the beauty and the wonder of earth. We celebrate brave little crocuses making their way out of the frozen soil. We rejoice to see red-breasted robins returning to Michigan. We are in awe of yellow forsythia showing its glory. And we give thanks for moments of sunlight that lift our spirits. Just as we give thanks for the beauty and wonder of the earth, we give thanks for the beauty and the wonder of humanity. We celebrate the brave souls who live their authentic selves. We rejoice in the diversity of gifts and talents that each person possesses. We are in awe of the unique beauty of every individual and we give thanks for acts of love which warm our souls. <clears throat> Having given thanks for these gifts, O oh God, we pause to remember some of the many concerns facing people we know as well as people in the greater world. We remember in our hearts those facing medical challenges and those struggling emotionally those seeking a safe place in which to live, and those caught in the crossfire of war, those living under oppression, and those seeking greater equality, those who are physically hungry, and those in need of justice. We give thanks, O oh God, for all of the people on this planet who are working to care for the earth and the needs of others. We pray that you will continue to show us as individuals and as a church how we can do the same. It is now in a spirit of love for you, for self, and for others that we enter a moment of silence in which to offer the prayers of our hearts. Most gracious God, we join Mary's family members and other loved ones in celebrating her 90th birthday and give thanks for all that she shares with this church. We pray that your comfort and your strength would be with Kathy's friend Sherry and her husband as he enters palliative care. May your healing love continue to give strength to Bella as she finds herself in the hospital. And we join Reek in giving thanks to all the many, many people in this church who have helped to make this project a beautiful success. United in spirit, we now offer the prayer that speaks of God's kingdom being realized here on earth, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
invite you to join with me in the Irish blessing found at the end of today's liturgy. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. May God hold you in the palm of God's hand.